Our lecture for today is on protein folding. Our objectives are as follows. We will look at Anfinsen's experiment, which is a hallmark experiment in protein folding that occurred in the late 1950s. Then we we're going to follow that up by looking at Leventhal's paradox that kind of led us to understand a little bit about what the third objective is, and that is how proteins fold. And uh, we're going to look at protein folding in vivo and in vitro. And then we'll discuss chaperones and their roles in protein folding. And then <clears throat> end the lecture with uh, folding enzymes. How do proteins fold into a three-dimensional structure? Well, we know that in vivo, when proteins are synthesized, they eventually fall into the three-dimensional structure. And it is the three-dimensional structure that is very important, is very critical to the function of the protein. And so <clears throat> the question is, how is that? How does, how does that happen? And Finson and his colleagues at the NIH perform a hallmark experiment in protein folding. And that is, they took a very small protein and they reduced the disulfide bridges with beta mercaptoethanol, followed by denaturation in 8 molar urea. <coughs> and so they found that when they reduced and denatured a protein, that it was completely inactive. But if they were to remove the urea and then oxidize to allow the bonds to form, uh, the disulfide bonds to be formed, then the enzyme returned back to its native state, about 90% activity. However, if they took the denatured and reduced uh, enzyme and they reversed the order, they oxidize at first to allow the disulfide bridges to form, followed by removal of the urea to allow renaturation of the protein, that the structure did not return to the three-dimensional shape that it had, but it was scrambled. And uh, the enzyme only uh, gained 1 to 2% of its activity. And so based on Anfinsen's experiment then, the following conclusion was reached, that proteins spontaneously fold into the three-dimensional structures. But the information that is necessary for the folding of the protein resides in the amino acid sequence, or the primary structure of the protein. So uh, this went on for quite a while. And uh, so the theory uh, that was proposed was based on that finding. And so uh, the possible ways that a protein could fold is that it could search randomly for all possible conformations. Uh, all the possibilities are tried until that protein arrives at the most stable conformation. Uh, and so that's the first possibility. The other possibility is that perhaps the protein does not experiment with all the possible conformations, but it only goes through a number of limited intermediates until it arrives at the final conformation uh, that is uh, uh, needed for its three-dimensional structure. And so Leventhal uh, came up with the uh, with the following calculation that really spurred people to begin to think in terms of the possibility of ways that the protein can fold. And so Leventhal came up with the following problem. If you were to take a 100 amino acid protein and you assume that each one of those amino acids will experiment three different conformations before it arrives at the final conformation. And let's say that it takes each conformation 0 0.1 picosecond for each one of those conformations. And so the search time will be the number of structures that will be formed, which is 5 times 10 to the 47, 
times the time that it takes uh, to uh, to uh, uh, to experiment with each one of those confirmation and so you will end up with the time of 5 times 10 to the 34 seconds right if we were to convert that to years it would be 1.5 times 10 to the 27 years and so the conclusion from this case is this, that if it takes 1.5 times 10 to 27 years for a tiny, tiny protein to fold and to experiment only three conformations for each amino acid before it arrives at the final conformation, then randomness or the random folding of protein must not occur because it takes too much or too many possibilities. And the, uh, uh, we can illustrate it this way. So if a monkey were to type, me thinks it is like a weasel, the monkey can do it, actually. But it will take the monkey 1 times 10 to the 40 keystrokes, random keystrokes, to actually come up with that phrase. But if you were to preserve correct one, or even partially correct ones, for instance, if the monkey just randomly types out the word ME, then you preserve that, and then uh, if it uh, uh, types up the word THIN, you preserve that as well. So the idea is, if you preserve partially correct terms, then it will only take that monkey's 2,431 random strokes to actually come up with the phrase, all right? And the difference is that uh, random versus partially correct intermediates that are preserved uh, is a tremendous, tremendous uh, number between the, the two. So this is the essence of protein folding, that maybe instead of a protein experimenting or trying each possible confirmation that the protein may actually just go through a number of intermediates before it goes from the completely unfolded to the three-dimensional structure that is necessary for its uh, uh, enzyme activity. And so this is what we're talking about. You go from an unfolded protein, it goes into an intermediate called a molten globule, which uh, has the structure of the three-dimensional structure, but very compact uh, before it arrives at the native uh, three-dimensional structure. And the indication that this may be true is that uh, a few years back, in, uh, in one of the databases that uh, hosts a number of proteins that have been discovered, uh, 39,323 proteins that were deposited of this there were only 1,000 unique folds, which means that over 90% of the structures deposited have similar folds with each other, meaning that uh, they, they share a, a lot of common intermediates before they go from, uh, as they go from uh, the primary structure to the three-dimensional structure. So, so this kind of gave us an idea that uh, the use of limited number of intermediates in protein folding is probably the way to go. And so protein folding then uh, is proposed or uh, is believed to have the following steps. Uh, the first step is uh, occurs within a few milliseconds, that is the formation of molten globule. And uh, the second step lasts about a second and native elements and tertiary structures begin to develop in a protein. And then third step is uh, single native uh, form is reached, and that has the lowest uh, uh, energy level. Okay, and this is just an il illustration, <coughs> and that is you go from unfolded protein to a molten globule to folded protein, which the use of one single intermediate. And if you were to plot it out in, uh, in terms of free energy versus folding process, you go from unfolded protein to a molten globule with a lower, lower energy than w where you began 
to a transitional state that is higher than uh, uh, the two previous states uh, to a final folded state which is even lower in energy than the molten globule uh, state. And so uh, this is uh, the uh, essence of protein folding. And so uh, this was tested really uh, on uh, uh, bacterial RNAs, which has 110 amino acids. And uh, uh, what they found was that this uh, uh, enzyme, this uh, uh, RNAs, uh, actually has only one intermediate, and this is the molten globule. So it goes from completely unfolded state to a molten globule to a three-dimensional state, so one intermediate, okay? So we go back to Leventhal's paradox then, that uh, uh, before people used to believe in a smooth energy landscape, and that is that when you're on top of this landscape right here, uh, there's a lot of different conformations right here by the uh, unfolded peptides. And these are highest energy level right here, different conformation. And as you get lower to lower energy level, you reduce the number of uh, conformations that the protein has until you arrive at the lowest energy level, which has one single conformation. Well, it turns out that that is too good to be true because in reality, uh, what happens is it doesn't look like a smooth energy landscape, but it, it, it has peaks and valleys in it that if you can imagine it, there are some proteins that as they progress from the top down to the bottom to arrive at the lowest energy state, they may actually be stuck right here on a mountain and never proceed to the final uh, three-dimensional shape. In other words, that uh, proteins can fold and something will prevent them from folding to, uh, uh, into their final three-dimensional shape. And uh, in that case, these proteins will be degraded by the proteasome system. And so uh, you begin to look at in vivo versus in vitro. Now, it is good when you look at in vivo, so you have protein that is synthesized and then it is unfolded, but then it begins to fold into its three-dimensional shape, right? If you were to take that unfolded protein and you put it into an environment that favors that protein to be folded, uh, it will, just like in vivo, fold into its three-dimensional uh, three shape at the lowest energy level. Now, that's good. But then, all of a sudden, when recombinant DNA came on, on the scene, uh, scientists began to learn that there's a difference between in vitro protein folding and in vivo protein folding. In recombinant DNA, uh, scientists were able to splice a gene from uh, human genomes, such as the uh, insulin gene, clone it into a bacterial vector and uh, uh, let the bacteria express the protein and the protein is isolated for use in the healthcare system. The problem with recombinant DNA, the challenging problem was this, that if you were to look at E. coli that did not in, uh, induce high levels of the protein versus E. coli that uh, express high levels of the proteins, you have huge bodies of aggregations that are called inclusion bodies uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, induced uh, bacterium. And you can imagine the reason is that the more of the recombinant protein that you express, the more of the inclusion bodies that are formed in this bacteria. Well, why is that? Well, the reason is when you do in vitro, you have concentration of 0.1 milligram per mil of protein. When you expose it to the right environment, that protein will spontaneously fold into its three-dimensional shape. However, in vivo, such as in the E. coli cytosol, look at this. The concentration of protein could reach as high as 340 milligram per mil, 
which means that this is a very crowded environment. And in recombinant DNA, as you boost the level of the protein, this crowded environment is almost impossible for protein folding to occur. And so when you don't have protein folding uh, that is favored by the high concentration of protein per volume, then the proteins begin to aggregate, and that's why you have the inclusion body. So uh, it was beautiful that uh, and Finson and his colleagues actually performed this experiment in vitro, but the problem is you cannot use that uh, with in vivo because in vitro uh, the environment uh, is very lax and it is very free uh, and not very obstructive, but uh, in vivo that environment is very, very crowded and uh, it favors uh, protein aggregation. Okay, so if that cannot be done in vivo then, then something has to occur based on Leventhal's paradox that you cannot experiment with all the possible confirmation. Then uh, if you only need a few confirmation, one, two, or three, intermediates before you arrive at the final confirmation, then something must be helping that process. And so the, the, uh, the idea for molecular chaperones was proposed, and that is these are proteins that, that will assist an unfolded protein in the folding process that will allow it to fold without aggregating. Uh, we do know that in the healthcare industry that we have chemical chaperones. These are chemicals that can be used to assist uh, protein uh, uh, folding. And then uh, uh, folding enzymes, we call this foldases. And uh, these are, uh, there are isomerases that will fo help in the formation of disulfide bond. And there are isomerases that will help in the formation of cis or trans uh, protein residues. Uh, depending on uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the need. Uh, and so, uh, Dr. Ritosa uh, and his colleagues in the 19 uh, uh, and colleagues in the 1960s uh, came up with an experiment that uh, discovery that kind of helped our understanding as we progress uh, to, toward understanding protein folding. And that is that when they were working with uh, Drosophila cells, large uh, dros uh, salivary Drosophila cells that express very large chromosomes, they found that if they were to expose these chromosomes to heat, I mean these cells to heat, and they look at the chromosomes, they were regions of puff puffy regions, right? These are puff areas, and you can see right here, from here to here, these regions are puffed areas, and it turns out these are areas of high transcriptional activity. Now, now we understand that if you already expose a cell to heed, that the expression of some genes are turned on and the protein products for those genes are expressed at high level when, uh, when these cells are exposed to, <coughs> to, uh, uh, to high temperature. Okay? It turns out that a whole family of proteins that are expressed with response to heat are called the heat shock proteins. These are the heat shock protein families. And they consist of a number of these uh, small heat shock proteins that can range in uh, uh, sizes from 10 to 30 kilodalton. And then heat shock protein 40, which has that, uh, um, uh, that each one of these number correspond to kilodalton size. Heat shock protein 60, heat shock protein 70, heat shock protein 90, and heat shock protein 100. These are all called chaperone proteins that assist in folding. Uh, we're not going to cover all of them. I'm going to talk about heat shock protein 60 and uh, 70 and the small heat shock proteins, but we're going to skip the rest of them. But basically, let me go through the function of these chaperones. So, heat shock protein 100 is a chaperone protein that 
uh, helps in pulling apart proteins from aggregation. Okay, uh, after proteins kind of aggregate, it kind of prevents aggregation by pooling, teasing off those proteins. Uh, let's see. Uh, heat shock protein 90 uh, is involved in uh, uh, again protein folding by sp stabilizing misfolded proteins until they can be folded properly. Heat shock protein 70 acts on uh, brand new nascent uh, peptides and uh, it allows them to uh, uh, to stay unfolded until a chaperone, another chaperone such as heat shock protein uh, 60 or 90 can uh, act upon them to help them in uh, folding. We're going to look at uh, heat shock protein uh, 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 60 and especially since it is uh, uh, it is one of the well studies uh, of the heat shock proteins. And then uh, heat shock protein 40 appears to be act uh, uh, to be a partner for heat shock protein 70 in protein folding. And then small heat shock proteins. Uh, these are heat shock proteins that form multimers, and these multimers interact with unfolded proteins that are unfolded in response to an insult. And then they interact with these proteins, and then when the insult is removed, they release these proteins, and uh, these proteins can then be folded uh, uh, with the help of other chaperones. Okay? So the work that was done uh, had to do with uh, the transport of proteins to the mitochondria. Uh, you're going to learn that uh, mitochondria proteins uh, that are synthesized in the cytosol actually have a signal peptide attached to them that destined them to the mitochondria. They are transported, unfolded to the mitochondria, and they are threaded through the outer and inner mitochondrial membrane into the matrix, and then wherever they belong, that peptide, signal peptide, is cleaved off, and then the question is, do they spontaneously fall into the three-dimensional structure, or is there a machinery within the mitochondria that helps them fold into the three-dimensional structure? In other words, do they get folded by help of assistance? Dr. Horowitz's uh, uh, group uh, at uh, Yale School of Medicine uh, actually has done a lot of work on uh, the role of heat shock protein 60, and we're going to look at this, uh, the function of this uh, heat shock protein. It turns out that when they generate, generated some lethal yeast mutants that are temperature sensitive, it turned out that uh, if they were to look at the mitochondrial proteins in these lethal mutants. Uh, some of these, uh, when they look at the proteins that are in the mitochondria, these proteins have a hard time folding into the three-dimensional structure. And so they begin to wonder, what is it that's keeping them from folding into their three-dimensional structure? Uh, the proteins were synthesized in the cytosol and they were transported into the mitochondria, but they failed to form, uh, to form the three-dimensional structures that are necessary for either function if they were monomeric or for assembly and function if they're uh, uh, multimeric uh, complexes and so forth. And so they worked with uh, uh, ornithine transcarbamylase, which is a, an enzyme that is uh, in the urea cycle. Uh, it is not made in yeast uh, in the mitochondria, so uh, but it uh, they uh, they begin to uh, generate these in yeast and uh, watch as it's transported from the uh, from the cytosol into the mitochondria with the help of a uh, uh, mitochondrial uh, signal peptide uh, on the uh, on the end of this protein, and so this protein actually is transported properly to the mitochondria, but once it got into the mitochondria, it's not folded properly, okay? And so the question was, what is it keeping from, uh, keeping this from, uh, uh, from folding? And this was not the only enzyme that, uh, proteins that people looked at. Uh, people looked at the monomeric uh, iron sulfur uh, 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 protein, uh, the uh, 
uh, the, uh, the other proteins that were uh, monomer or dimer or tetramer and so forth. They were looking at these, and what they found was that they were not folded properly and they were not assembled into their uh, complexes to be functional. And so when they began to work with rescuing these, uh, uh, these lethal mutants, they found that the protein that was expressed that was different between the rescue and the lethal mutants was none other than heat shock protein 60. So it turns out that heat shock protein 60 is necessary in the mitochondria in order to mediate the folding of mitochondrial proteins after they've been transported from the, from the cytosol into the mitochondria in their unfolded state. And so this is the structure of the heat shock protein, pro, uh, protein 60 homolog in bacteria. And this is called the GROL, which is a barrel shape uh, uh, protein right here. And uh, it has GROES, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, lid for this. Okay? So, you can see that there, there's an equator right here, and there's an opening on top, a groyel opening on the bottom. So there are two chambers right here, okay? And uh, the groyes can either be attached to the top or attached to the bottom, but uh, uh, it, it's sort of like if it's attached to the bottom, the bottom, I mean the top, the bottom is free. If it's attached to the bottom, the top is open. And we're going to see why, why that is. It turns out that uh, uh, proteins that are unfolded can get into this barrel, either in the top chamber or the bottom chamber, and they can interact with hydrophobic residues on the inside of the barrel, on the apical region right here. Okay, But when grow ES, when the lid is attached, right? And there's ATP that is bound to the equatorial region as well. So you have the uh, protein that is interacted with the uh, hydrophobic region, uh, apical region, and then you have ATP that is bound to the uh, equatorial region. When the grow ES lid is bound, then this goes, this, uh, this grow EL will go into a twist an expanded shape such that the protein is now kicked out and it's free inside the it's not bound anymore by hydrophobic interaction it's free within this barrel now part of the grow es lid is interacting with part of the apical region through again hydrophobic interaction and with atp hydrolysis at the equatorial region it provides enough energy for the protein to begin to fold into its three-dimensional structure. And so, if we were to look at the mechanism, then uh, we can see the following. That is that uh, you have the grow EL right here, and I'm going to look at focus on the top. ATP is bound to the equatorial region. Now the unfolded protein comes into the chamber. When the grow ES binds to close the lid, uh, it goes into a twisting and expanding, uh, expanding motion right here. And uh, uh, with uh, uh, ATP, when ATP is hydrolyzed, then that protein begins to fold into its three-dimensional structure. And again, uh, with the addition of ATP, ATP now is going to be bound to the bottom, the equatorial region of the bottom right here. When ATP binds, then grow ES opens up, and then the protein that is folded into its three-dimensional shape uh, is expelled. Now, you can see now we're focusing on the bottom. You have ATP bound to the bottom equatorial region, and uh, you have, uh, with ATP hydrolysis, the protein folds into its three-dimensional shape right here, okay? And with the addition of ATP to the top equatorial region, then the GROES lid comes off and the protein is expelled, and then uh, the whole process starts again. This is the way that heat shock protein 60 assists in the folding of proteins in the mitochondria. 
And similar systems actually exist in the eukaryotic cytosol uh, as well. So this is one way that heat shock protein 60 can participate in, uh, in, uh, uh, in protein folding. Okay? Heat shock protein 40 and 70, <coughs> 70 uh, participates and 40 participate in uh, the nascent peptide. And so they can participate this way. They can bind to the newly synthesized peptide and uh, allow this uh, peptide to fall into its native three-dimensional shape. Okay, uh, it can also participate with heat shock protein 40, where heat shock protein 70 and 40 bind to the nascent peptide, and allowing the nascent peptide to fall into its three-dimensional shape, or they can go through other pathways. So that's the heat shock protein 90 pathway, and uh, that process can can uh, can continue through that uh, pathway, or uh, that heat shock protein 70 can assist in the transport of the nascent peptide to the region where it's needed. And so imagine this, that these were the mitochondria, heat shock protein 70 and 40 can, uh, can escort the uh, nascent peptide to the uh, uh, mitochondria and through the mitochondrial membrane. And when, when they get to the inside, then they release that uh, peptide, and that peptide is going to be folded with the help of, uh, of the uh, uh, heat shock protein 60. Okay? And again, like we said, uh, these uh, barrels also exist in the cytosol. And so heat shock protein 70 can deliver this to the uh, uh, cytosolic uh, barrel, uh, which can go through the same uh, same mechanism that we've looked at for his shock protein 60. Uh, and again, this is just uh, another way uh, uh, of looking at this, but I'm going to go on uh, to small heat shock proteins. Small heat shock proteins uh, form uh, a number of oligomers. And so the oligomers actually serve to bind uh, misfolded proteins. So uh, in response to, let's say, heat shock, the multimers uh, or the oligomers of uh, small heat shock proteins uh, will will bind the partially denatured or misfolded protein in response to heat shock, and then when they you remove the uh, uh, when you remove the insult or the heat, then they can release these proteins, and these proteins will fall into its uh, their three-dimensional shape, either by themselves or through the help of, uh, of chaperones. And this is just uh, another diagram for it. And that is, uh, uh, so, so you have uh, this uh, multimer that are formed. Uh, they form stable complex with uh, uh, partially denatured proteins. And when you remove the insult, the temperature, then they can uh, guide those pro uh, denatured proteins to other uh, chaperones that will assist in their folding. Uh, this is just an illustration that the ER has its own uh, uh, chaperone system. And uh, this is the unfolded protein that is synthesized. And then it is modified, it is glycosylated, it's modified. And then glucose appears to be the signal uh, uh, molecule that is attached to a uh, glycosylated uh, protein that is synthesized in the uh, ER. Then it is bound to uh, uh, calnexin or calreticulin uh, in the uh, uh, in the in the ER, and then the glucose is trimmed off, and then the protein begins to fold with the help of two enzymes that we're going to cover, uh, the uh, 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 two isomerases that we've looked at, and we're going to look at at the last on the last two slides. And then uh, with the help of this protein, it begins to fold into its three-dimensional shape, and then, then it is transported to its final destination, uh, Golgi uh, out to the membrane or Golgi out to the outside of the cell. Now, if the protein doesn't, uh, I mean, if the protein fails to form uh, a, uh, uh, a proper, uh, properly folded uh, structure, then it will go through the cycle again. 
all right uh, where glucose is going to be added on to it again and then uh, the f process begins it goes to calnexin uh, glucose is removed and then folding begins uh, uh, begins again with the help of uh, the isomerase enzymes if it doesn't fold uh, after uh, repeated tries then that is kicked out uh, to the outside where it's going to be uh, uh, degraded by the uh, uh, proteasome okay if it's full properly then it's going to be transported traffic to the Golgi out to the membrane or out to the outside if it's not folded properly then it's going to be degraded by the cytosolic uh, uh, system uh, proteasome uh, the two proteins that aid in the folding of these proteins is uh, uh, one of them is disulfide isomerase and you can tell disulfide isomerase is uh, uh, participate in the formation of disulfide bond by actually providing uh, its cysteine residues to interact with the uh, disulfide bridges. Uh, and here's a demonstration. Uh, so what happened is uh, you have a uh, uh, disulfide isomerase that will donate one of its cysteine to interact with a uh, uh, cysteine side chain on the uh, uh, substrate molecule and then uh, uh, it guides the uh, formation of the proper uh, disulfide bridge okay so uh, it does that in order to guide the formation of disulfide bridges uh, between the correct partners and the last one is peptidyl proline isomerase and that is uh, proline residues can exist in the trans or cis conformation the most the most common uh, confirmation that they exist in because it's stable uh, is the uh, uh, is the trans conformation okay so uh, when they exist in the trans conformation uh, it's uh, it's it's very stable that peptide bond is very stable however there are some uh, uh, a few proteins uh, that require the formation of cis peptide bond in that uh, in that region and so uh, and so uh, the uh, the point that must be made is that in order for the correct trans or cis peptide bond to be formed uh, it needs the assistance of uh, peptidyl proline isomerases and so there you have the uh, whole story of how proteins fall into the three-dimensional shape